Hello and welcome to today's webinar. You're, we're happy you could join us. My name is Naya Hyde and I'm the marketing assistant for K-12 education products here at Brooks Publishing. Before we start, we do have two polls we would love for you to answer. So I will open up the first one. Um, the first poll is just, what is your role in schools? Um, so feel free to click any of these options that do apply to you. Awesome, thank you everyone. So you can choose between teacher, school-based, or community-based, um, administrator, other school, staff, or parent, or none of the above, but you care about kids. All these answers are awesome. Um, thank you so much for answering. Keep it open for a few seconds longer. Perfect, thank you, everyone. So let's share these results. So 25% of our attendees are teachers, 23% uh, are school-based or community-based mental health professionals, 10% administrators, other school staff or parent, 29%, and none of the above, but I care about kids, 12%. That is awesome. Um, I guess let's head over to this, our second poll. All right, and this one is, has your school experienced a death in the past year? Check all that apply. Um, so you can choose between school, select one or more of the following. So school staff member due to COVID-19, school staff member unrelated to COVID-19, student due to COVID-19, student unrelated to COVID-19, family member of a staff or student member due to COVID-19. And we do appreciate everyone participating in these polls. Awesome. Perfect, so I'll be sharing those results. 28% said school staff member due to COVID-19. 17% of our attendees said school staff member unrelated to COVID-19. 5% said student due to COVID-19, 19% said student unrelated to COVID-19, and 73% said family member of a student or staff member due to COVID-19. We do appreciate, again, all of your responses, um, and we're really excited that you joined us today for this webinar. Um, but before we start, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Perfect. Um, you'll be muted for the webinar, but if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to type them into the question box. We'll take these questions after the presentation during the Q&A portion of the webinar. For the presentation, you might want to minimize the GoToWebinar bar on your monitor so you can see more of your screen. You can do that by clicking the orange button with the arrow at the top corner of the control bar. If you need to enlarge the bar again to ask a question, you can just click the button once again. If you experience any audio issues at any point, you can switch the phone by clicking in the audio section of the webinar panel and using the dial-in information um, provided. Also, we are recording this webinar, so everyone who registered for the event will receive a link to the recording in a follow-up email tomorrow. Next slide, please. Awesome. During today's presentation, David Schoenfeld and Marsha Quackenbush will reference content from their upcoming book, The Grieving Student, A Guide for Schools, Second Edition. Educators with, and other profess, school professionals can be a critical lifeline for grieving children. With the second edition of this best-selling book, school staff will have the practical guidance they need to provide sensitive support to students of all ages and their families. To learn more about the book, you can visit the URL shown on the screen. Like I said, this is a second edition, so we'd like to um, just open up one more poll to ask um, our attendees if you have read any of the current first edition of The Grieving Students. I'm gonna launch that poll now. Okay. 
Um, let's head over to the next slide and we'll, we will revi revisit um, that poll. Um, thank you guys again. Um, I'm happy to announce that Brooks will be giving away three copies of David and Marcia's upcoming book, The Grieving Student, A Guide for Schools, second edition. Winners will be randomly selected from today's live attendees and notified by email after the webinar. To increase your chances, be sure to submit your questions in the questions pane throughout the presentation. The next slide. Also, we did wanna mention at the end of the webinar, you will be prompted to complete a short survey. We'd love to know what you thought of the webinar. And again, anyone who completes this survey will be entered to win a free book. Everyone watching this webinar will also be able to download a certificate of attendance. For those of you watching live, you can download your certificate from the handouts pane. Live attendees, you will also be emailed your certificate in the next 24 hours. And for those of you who are watching this webinar as a recording, stay tuned to the end of today's webinar to learn about how you can access your certificate. Without further delay, I'm happy to introduce today's speakers. David J. Schoenfeld is director of the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and professor of clinical pediatrics at Keck School of Medicine of the University of Southern California. He has provided consultation, technical assistance, and training in the areas of pediatric bereavement and school crisis preparedness and response for over three decades. We also have Marcia Quackenbush joining us today. Um, she is a licensed family therapist and certified master health education specialist. She has more than 20 years of clinical men mental health experience, much of which has been focused on children, adolescents, and families of people living with life-changing conditions or people coping with terminal illness in themselves or family members. Thank you so much for joining us today, David and Marcia. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna try and do a, a brief presentation that just has some practical guidance for all school professionals on how you would support grieving students. And I wanna start by saying that death and grief affects the lives of almost all children at some point. And in the era of COVID-19, more families are uh, than ever experiencing significant losses. So teachers and other school professionals can be, as already described, critical lifelines for grieving students who may struggle with academic performance, social relationships, and behavior after the death of someone they love. And this doesn't, though, require the classroom educators provide bereavement counseling, but rather that they provide an empathic presence. So I can tell the story. I was talking to one teacher and she mentioned how a middle school age child was out for a week because of his mother's illness. He came back to school and that's when she found out his mother had died. Uh, this was prior to the pandemic, so she gave him a hug. She said she was so sorry to hear that and wasn't aware and started to try and talk about how she could be of support. And apparently he, he just said, please don't do this. He was embarrassed. So she said, that's okay. Um, but just know that I'm here and you can come and talk to me at any point. My door is always open. And, and that's the case for everyone in the school. Well, he didn't come back to talk about his mother, but he did drop by about three weeks later after school just to say thanks. And when she asked why, he said, you were here and I didn't have to talk about it. And she said that she realized that sometimes kids don't want to talk about it, but they do want to know that you care and that you're there for them. And she gave an excellent metaphor. She said, it's like a dance. I take the first step, if the student is ready, they take the next step, we continue the dance. If not, that's okay. We can just stop and listen to the music together. And I think that's a lot of what we're gonna be doing with children, um, whether they're already in school or will be returning to school. Um, we're all impacted by this in one way or another. Um, and a lot of it is just listening to the music together with them. It's not necessarily what you say, it's that you're there and that you're present and that you care. So the first thing is it's, you have to acknowledge the loss. There's a common myth that talking to children about a death that's occurred is just going to upset them. But when you ask children how they're feeling after the death of someone close to them, the upset that you do see is not about the question, but rather it's about the loss they had experienced. But we also have to recognize that many children and their families may not notify the school that when the child has experienced death, and many children and adolescents may not even appear to be grieving when you do see them. And there are many reasons for that. One is that adults, adults may unintentionally communicate to children that death is not something that's openly discussed. If a young child is told that a, a parent has died, um, often the first question they're going to have is, does that mean that I won't see daddy for um, Halloween or for my birthday? And what happens is a surviving parent will often become tearful at that point. And the child who is very egocentric will often assume that it's something they did or said that caused their mother to be distressed. And they may then turn around and give support to the mom. 
and say things like, it's okay, mom, um, I'll be able to uh, do everything dad used to do, we're gonna be okay. Um, and adolescents, by the way, do that as well. And it often gives the false impression to parents that um, actually their kids are not grieving, when in fact they are. But there are other reasons why children don't appear to be grieving. Very young children may not yet understand what's happened or at least all of its implications. Um, children experience the death of the person and that's considered the primary loss, but they also lose everything that person did for them or might do for them in the future. And those are the secondary losses. Kids don't anticipate the secondary losses the same way adults do. I remember talking to one dad after his wife died in an accident and he said, I live in dread of the day my daughter has her first period. She really should have her mother on that day. Well, her, the daughter was only about five years old. So I assure you, she wasn't thinking about that at that time, but she will be confronted with it when that time does come. And it's very likely she will be acutely missing the support that her mother might have been able to provide her at that time. The children grow into their loss as they start to understand the magnitude. But children uh, sometimes do understand what's happened and all of its implications, but then they just feel so overwhelmed they don't want to talk about it. They may be afraid that even if they talk to a counselor in a private office before school starts, they won't really be able to pull it together and go back to the first period. Children also express their grief in many ways indirectly, either through their behavior or through their play. There are many games that children play where death is a theme. We've all played uh, games about death with young children. There's one game that we all play with kids. It uh, happens in the first year of life, about the second half of the first year of life. Um, and many people have said it's the first game about death. Um, and that game, we call it's played in all cultures around the world at the same developmental period. Um, and we call it here in the United States. Starts to start with the thought of permanent loss, and they start to play peekaboo. And what happens is that the child fixes their gaze on an adult, um, and then there's separation. And with that separation is heightened concern and awareness, and then joy at reunion. And then they need to play it again and again and again. So you always have to ask yourself, why do kids play this game repeatedly in every culture in the world at the same time period? And as I said, some people said it's the first game about death. And while most people don't realize it, if you translate peekaboo literally from Old English, it's alive or dead. And that's what the game is about. So children start to talk about this from a very young age. But children may also be aware of what's going on, understand it, not necessarily feel very overwhelmed about it, but still consciously decide to keep their losses private. Um, grief is in many ways a personal experience and children may, and adults may not wish to share it. We saw, for example, in New York City after 9-11, a number of families that decided not to inform the school that a parent had died in the World Trade Center attack because the kids had decided they didn't want to be identified as one of the 9-11 kids. I think we're gonna see the same thing in this pandemic where many kids will not want to share their losses from the pandemic openly for a number of reasons. Now, many adults also don't talk about it because they don't know what to say and um, and say the wrong thing. So I find it useful to review some well-intentioned comments that I think we've all made. It might be the best not to share with grieving students or at least to reconsider. So first off, you don't wanna try and cheer up survivors by making statements such as, I know it hurts very much right now, but I know you're gonna feel better within a short period of time. Instead, allow them their grief and the time that it takes for them to cope. Anything that begins with at least should probably be considered. At least he's not in pain anymore, at least you still have a mother, et cetera. You also don't want to encourage them to be strong or to cover up their emotions. You should feel free to express your own feelings and to demonstrate empathy, but don't state you know exactly how someone else feels. So comments like, I realize this must be extremely difficult for you, or I can only begin to imagine what this is like for you and your family, are good ways to start a conversation and demonstrate empathy, and they're open-ended. But I would avoid saying things like, I know exactly what you're going through, because you really can't know how someone else is feeling, you have to ask them. You don't want to say you must be angry, you want the individual to express their own feelings, and you shouldn't tell them how they ought to feel. You should also limit the sharing of your own personal loss experiences and keep the focus to the extent possible on the grieving child and that child's personal experience. 
What you want to do is just allow the child to be upset and suspend your judgment. Don't try and figure out if this is a normal or abnormal reaction, but do intervene whenever safety or health is a concern, such as if the child voices suicidal or homicidal thoughts. Now, some people are also worried because they worry that they're going to say or do the wrong thing because they're ill-informed about another person's culture. Now, although there are differences in cultural mourning practices, the fundamental experience of grief is universal. And when we recognize there is a range of ways that we can express and experience our grief, we can then explore ways to bridge whatever cultural differences there are in order to help grieving children and their families. So ask questions when you're unsure what would be most helpful for a family or an individual. The reality is that assumptions may actually result in stereotypes that cloud our perceptions and make us miss opportunities to be helpful. I had the opportunity to visit an Amish family after they had a young child that died. And um, as I was walking through the home, the grandmother pointed out a picture of her daughter that was on the wall. And she said, you know, one day my grandchildren were over and they were playing outside. And I went to check on them and there was a photographer who was a tourist from out of state and he was taking pictures of my grandchildren. And what I did was I reminded him that that really is a violation of our religious and cultural beliefs. I considered the images graven images and felt it was inappropriate to take photographs of themselves and others in their community. But what happened was that the child was so excited, she was about five years of age at the time, and had never had her picture taken, that she begged her grandmother to let him take the picture and said that he had promised to send a copy. So she said, I was so embarrassed that I allowed it to happen. Um, and then she pointed to the picture and she said, what a gift from God, because if I hadn't allowed that, I wouldn't have a picture to remember her. Now, if I had entered that conversation with a judgment about what I believed I understood about the culture, which I actually already knew that Amish generally do not take photographs. But if I had communicated that or expressed that in some way with his grandmother, I don't know that she would have felt comfortable telling me that that was exactly what she was doing. So instead, we should approach the family with an open mind and an open heart. Help families identify and communicate to you what's important to them about cultural practices in their family and their community um, and their religion, their ethnicity, and then work with them to find solutions and compromises when the realities require modifications in cultural practices. For example, during this pandemic, it may not be safe to have family members clean or prepare the body for funeral if the individual died from COVID-19. They may not be able to have uh, large funeral ceremonies, sit shiva, or visit grieving families to bring over food. But what we have been seeing is the use of virtual services, even virtual shiva, and there is, of course, an app for coordination of meal delivery through online services for families who are grieving. Now, while identifying grieving students, one thing I did want to point out is the importance to look for guilt reactions. Young children tend to be very egocentric, and they assume that they control external events through their actions and their thoughts. And they also have a limited understanding of the actual causes of death. So in order to make some sense of death of someone close to them, Children will often come up with explanations that rely on what we call magical thinking and assume there was something they did, didn't do, or should have done that somehow could have prevented the death of someone close to them, and that will leave them with guilt. Even older children and adults often feel guilty when there's really no logical, objective reason for them to feel responsible. At one level, we assume that individuals may um, feel that they're responsible and that that brings them some initial feeling of control, at least at an unconscious level, they may make this choice. Because it may help them believe that by taking different actions than they had taken before, they can somehow prevent future deaths of others with whom uh, they have close relationships. And that illusion of control may bring some initial comfort, but it leaves the child or the adult with longstanding guilt, which just impairs adjustment. So children who experience the death of a family member during this pandemic may question how they may have inadvertently exposed the family member to the virus um, or ask themselves how they might have picked up on symptoms before the illness became serious or wondered what they might have done to get help earlier on in the illness. This guilt continues to be an extremely common reaction with older children, adolescents, and adults. And for that reason, I think it's often helpful to reassure children and adults of their lack of responsibility for a death. 
For guilt that does persist, often the best approach I find is to ask the individuals if they intended to cause this, and invariably they will say no. And then I ask them what they think it's going to take before they're ready to forgive themselves. I do reassure them that I don't think they're responsible, but sometimes that's not enough for them to give up that, that feeling of personal responsibility. So then I move to thoughts of forgiveness. Let me turn to now some practical suggestions of strategies you can use in classroom settings to support grieving students. One has to do with academic accommodations. It's common for students to experience at least temporary academic challenges after the death of a family member or close friend, and you're gonna see this in the majority of students dealing with a major crisis such as this pandemic. Pre-existing learning challenges often become worse and new ones may develop, and that can be due to a number of reasons difficulty concentrating because of disrupted sleep, anxiety, and depression, difficulty learning, remembering, or applying new concepts, challenges with completing homework because children have competing obligations, um, including for some older children to earn money to support uh, the family during the pandemic, but there's also often the lack of availability of parental assistance or a disrupted home environment, particularly when a caregiver has died. And children may learn material, but still have trouble demonstrating that learning on tests. It's important that we offer the academic support proactively. We don't want to wait for students to begin demonstrating academic challenges, and we specifically do not want to wait for these academic, academic challenges to become academic failure. Schools can and should be a source of support to grieving or traumatized students. But if academic expectations even temporarily exceed students' capacity to learn, Schools are likely to become an additional source of distress as students struggle to keep up with the work. We want to assist grieving students in identifying the level of academic work that feels both appropriate and achievable. So I've listed some helpful modifications on this slide. You might change an assignment. For example, allow a student to work on a project with a partner rather than complete it by themselves, but recognize for some students they may find it harder to collaborate while they're grieving and actually prefer an option to work alone rather to, than to work on a group project. Students might want to take a formal research paper and substitute instead a more engaging assignment, such as an oral history project or a video. Some kids, when they're grieving, feel self-conscious about their appearance. And the last thing they would want to do is an oral presentation or have themselves be videotaped. So the point I'm trying to make is that there aren't particular types of accommodations that work for grieving students. It's just that you need to make accommodations for what works for the particular student who's grieving. You may also want to change the focus or timing of a classroom lesson. A literature class might choose a different book to discuss if the one originally scheduled describes a death similar to the one a student is currently grieving. A health class, for example, on the dangers of substance abuse might be postponed or at least the student excused if they just lost a sip they do to a drug overdose. You can also reschedule or adapt tests. And immediately after death, students might be exempted from some testing or given modifications, such as testing alone in a quiet location with extra time. Scores could be omitted or weighted less in determining final grades if they occurred soon after the death. You should consider 504 plans or modification in the student's IEP if a student's already receiving special education services. The goal is for teachers to find a balance between maintaining reasonable expectations so the child can be promoted and succeed the following school year, and also providing the additional support and accommodations for grieving students. Another practical issue has to do with how do we handle grief triggers in the classroom settings. Grief triggers are sudden reminders of someone who died that can cause temporary but still powerful emotional responses in children who are grieving. Since grief triggers can be anything that reminds children of the person that died, such as a song their mother used to sing, a country they visited on vacation with their cousin that was mentioned in social studies, or a poem in class that just talks about the friendship of siblings right after a sibling has died, or a reminder by a teacher simply for the students to discuss something with their parents after a parent has died. These are hard to predict, and they often catch children off guard. Remember one teenager telling me that she was in a biology class and they were learning, they were doing a unit on blood vessels and the teacher had asked if anyone knew what an uh, aneurysm was. So she raised her hand and answered the question and didn't expect the follow-up question. The teacher then asked what can happen if an aneurysm ruptures. 
And the girl said, well, if it's in an important organ like the brain and it ruptures, then the person might bleed and die. And she turned to me and she said, you know, it's, it's not my teacher's fault. She didn't know that my dad died of a ruptured brain aneurysm. And she just said, it's kind of ironic. Teachers can say something that don't mean anything to them and not realize how, what a profound impact it has on the student. And then she shared with me that one of her friends had just been joking about a ruptured brain aneurysm earlier that day. And so it isn't just educators, it's really everyone. So you want to let kids know that these grief triggers do occur and work out a safety plan. Teachers and other school personnel can explain that the triggers are likely to occur and then work over with children, work out with children what they're gonna do so they don't feel out of control. Some helpful responses to these triggers include providing a safe space or location where the student can go, such as going to the school social workers or counselor's room, or just to the library or classroom across the hall. Or it might be an adult that the child can talk to when they're feeling upset or wanting to talk. And you want to set procedures for the student to obtain that support that's discreet, such as a signal or statement that doesn't draw attention but allows the student to leave the classroom to either seek support or go to a safer space. One teacher, for example, worked out that the student would just take a tissue that was from a box near the door, and when he left, she knew he was having a grief trigger. I understand it may be difficult for children to walk through the school in this way during the pandemic, so work out something you can do that keeps the child in the classroom. I had one teacher who shared with me that, and this was prior to the pandemic, that he had a student whose father had died recently, and she wore a hoodie to class, and whenever she was feeling overwhelmed, she just put the hood up. They joked that it was a hoodie moment, and he knew not to call on her during that time. And then when she was ready to re-engage with the classroom discussion, she just put the hood down. And he just looked at me and said, you know, I respect her to let me know what she's able to do and not able to do. And it's better than she stay at home by herself grieving. And at least she's getting something out of the lessons. I've done some virtual academic courses and had students who are acutely grieving personal losses that happened the same day. And we've worked out that they could just leave. First off, I tell them they don't have to participate in the class, but actually in each of the cases they wanted to. They thought the information was particularly relevant in their lives, but I, we worked out that they would keep their camera off. So that way they could just step away from the camera whenever they were feeling upset and no one would know. And that way they could participate to the level they want. Staff can also work with children and families to anticipate and minimize likely grief triggers. For example, if you're gonna be doing a Father's Day activity, teacher could announce to the class, we're gonna be writing poems for Father's Day. Some of you may have a father who's, who um, is not, you may not have a father who's alive or currently living with you. And you can focus on your memories of your dad or you just choose, you can just choose to pick some other male that was important in your life. Someone who cares for you and has provided support. And that way we can all do this um, activity together and then just let them get started and follow up with questions individually. This, by the way, will also be helpful for other children who may not know their father or may have a father who's deployed, incarcerated, no longer involved with the family or otherwise absent or distant. Now, while these are some general considerations that I've gone over about how to support grieving students, let me just address in a couple of minutes some of the unique challenges of supporting grieving students during this pandemic. After the death of someone close, children often become more concerned about their health and that of others they care about. This happens outside of a pandemic. But in the setting of a pandemic, there's already often extreme concern about uh, the health of uh, each individual themselves and that of others that they care about. So your ability to reassure children that others close to the child are unlikely to die becomes more difficult. And, and that is even if the death that occurred was unrelated uh, to the pandemic or even to an infectious disease. So it becomes important that we help children deal with their fears and concerns about the pandemic in addition to any grief they may be experiencing after personal loss. We have the COVID-19 pandemic resources webpage on the website for the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement that includes presentations and materials for educators, parents, and other professionals on how to talk to and support children during this pandemic. We also need to recognize that physical distancing measures, including some of the lengthy school closures we've experienced, increases social isolation, which is already experienced by grieving children, and it makes it difficult for schools to provide support using traditional means. And while this is true, it's also true that schools have provided meaningful support to grieving students 
when deaths occur during summer or holiday breaks using phone, email, and the internet. And these same strategies can be used during a pandemic when school closures are required and are discussed in the book. I already mentioned secondary losses, uh, but these become even more of an issue during the pandemic. Um, the magnitude and the importance of the secondary losses due to the physical distancing and the sexual and the school extended school closures becomes an issue. And families may have significant challenges meeting even basic needs, such as obtaining food or providing supervision to children after the death of a caregiver. In the usual outpouring of assistance, support, and companionship that normally we see provided by extended family, friends, neighbors, and members of the school community, at least in the immediate aftermath of a death, may not occur. Funerals may be postponed and family and friends unable to visit. Family members may also be so overwhelmed by the pandemic in addition to their grief that the surviving family members may be preoccupied with the pandemic and meeting the needs of their own family. So not only aren't they able to come and visit to support the child and surviving family members, but they may not even take the time to call because of their own concerns. And the role of school professionals therefore becomes even more important. We also wanna recognize that some grief may not be related to a loss due to death. For some people who don't experience the death of someone they know, they still have to cope with separation from loved ones, such as due to travel restrictions. But they may also grieve their inability to celebrate their graduation, their birthday, or special holidays. And transitions, such as from high school to college, which is always hard for grieving students, may be particularly challenging during this pandemic. And then lastly, supporting grieving individuals can be difficult in the best of times, and obviously this is not the best of times. And so this is a particularly different, difficult, but critical time to maintain your own professional self-care and personal self-care for the family members among you. It's critical that we invest in that now. Now these issues are all addressed in the second edition of The Grieving Student. But before I ended, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what's new in the second edition compared to the first. While the first edition focused primarily on teachers, classroom educators, in the new edition, we've broadened the audience to include educators more generally, including administrators, school mental health professionals, and educational support professionals. And of course, the material is still relevant for parents who have children that attend school. We've also added two new chapters. One, edition, one addresses the special issues raised by suicide. This was a lot of interest in this topic and a lot of need for more information. These deaths present a number of particular challenges for students and schools. The other new chapter looks at ways to implement support for grieving students in settings other than K-12 public schools. While our overall focus is still on the K-12 environment, Guidance in this book is gonna be relevant in any setting where young people gather under adult supervision to socialize or learn. We share ideas about ways to adapt the book's recommendations in, for younger children, pre-K, in college and trade schools, homeschool settings, online only schools, charter schools, private and boarding schools, and community-based um, organizations. We've also provided more information about crisis incidents in schools including a first-person account by the principal of a school that experienced an on-campus on shooting resulting in multiple deaths. And the forward for this edition is written by Superintendent Robert Runsey of Broward County Public Schools regarding the impact of the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. We've also significantly expanded the companion online study guide and integrated free video and print resources from the coalition to support grieving students. So at this point, I'm gonna turn this over to questions uh, from both um, from both Marsha and me. Awesome. Oh, forgot to open that back up. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you guys so much. Um, we did get a lot of questions, so I'll start with this first one. Um, what guidance can you give to teachers who might be dealing with challenging behaviors related to death in the family? Should the teacher address the death of the child or remain silent and just address the behavior? Marsha, did you want to start with that? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. If if a child if a child's behaviors are problematic after a death, I, I didn't quite understand the question. All right, let me. Um, yes, the question it. was what to do. 
Um, it asks, what guidance can you give to teachers who might be dealing with challenging behaviors related in students related to death in the family? Should the teacher address the death um, with the child or should they remain silent and just address the child's challenging behaviors? Um, it's always helpful to be able to talk about death with a grieving student because so many things in our culture, so many things in their lives say, don't talk about it. We don't wanna hear about it. It makes us uncomfortable. And as David mentioned, a lot of that is really unintentional. It's just that we, we don't talk about death very well um, as a culture. Most of us don't have a lot of experience about it. So absolutely, you need to address disruptive behavior if it's interfering with other students' ability to learn. If a student is putting him or herself at risk, then certainly you're gonna to have to do something about that. But also to mention the death, to talk about it frankly, simply in, in these simple ways that David gave examples of, to say, I'm wondering how you're feeling about the loss of your father these days. This must be a challenge. What is it like for you? Um, to ask the student that directly and, and let that student know you can handle it. I, you know, one of my favorite things that David's mentioned in a number, he's done a zillion webinars over this past year. And one of the pieces of guidance, of, of guidance is don't pretend everything is okay when it obviously isn't. And I think that's a really great piece of advice for the pandemic, as well as dealing with a grieving student. So that would be my answer. And David, did you wanna add something? No, I, I, the only thing I would add is that sometimes you observe behavior and it can be useful to share that observation with the student, but you want to do it in a way that's non-judgmental. So you yes. wouldn't wanna say, you know, you, you're not talking enough in class since your mother, since you came back after your mother's death. Instead, I would say, I've noticed that you're talking less. I just wondered, how are you doing since your mother died? So you can make an observation, but try and make sure it's not judgmental, and because then I think it puts the child on the defense. But everything else, uh, Marsha, I, I, you know, I think you covered it quite nicely. Awesome, great response. Um, another question we got is, do you have any tips on how to help students remotely who are dealing with grief? So David, I, go ahead on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with it. I think what you want to do is first acknowledge it. So um, I, you're probably not going to say something in the middle of an online class, but you certainly can call the student and the student's family outside of the class, tell them that you've heard what's happened um, and that you wanted to express your condolences and you also wanted to offer to help. Um, and and then you know talk about what strategies can we use to help you continue to learn some some kids find um they may find it actually easier to be in a um, online classroom than an in-person classroom when they're grieving because they can take some distance as i mentioned but they may also find it very boring and um, miss the social contact and support that they might have uh, might have had if they were in person. So you, you just have to work out what works best for you and how can we support you. But I think the most important thing is you have to reach out. Um, you have to let the kid know that you're aware and you care and you're there for them. Um, and recognize that sometimes when you reach out, people don't, you know, you invite people to talk, but sometimes they're not ready or they don't wish to. And you just have to remain present and continue to check in with them. Um, be, and, and don't just wait for them to tell you when they need help, check to see how they're doing. And Marsha, if you wanna add something to it. Yeah, and a lot of times the checking in can just, it can be how, once you've established you're there to talk with them about whatever might come up, then it might just be, how are things going? You know, to begin with, you're like, I, I heard about the death of your sister. I am so sorry, and I'm wondering how you're doing. But you know, the next time you might just say, how are things going for you these days? Um, but to, to continue to make that contact every so often, to reassure the student that you continue to be interested and available. That was a great advice for sure. Because oftentimes I feel like people ask maybe once or twice, but then they don't follow up. And like, that's the most important part. So great response. Um, you know, one of the things I, I'll also add, one of the things in the book that we talk about is supporting grieving students over time. Because a, a student who loses a parent, say in second grade, 
will be experiencing that grief really for the rest of their lives. And so what does a, a teacher in fifth grade or seventh grade or at high school graduation, what does an educator offer um, when that's been that student's history? And, I, and there's really that checking in over time is in, immensely valuable to, to affirm the student's experience of loss. Definitely. So check out the book, everyone, for more information on that. Um, another question we got was, how do we help a child that doesn't want to admit they're grieving? Well, I, I think a lot of times children don't want to admit that they're having problems. And a lot of times they're just going to say, well, it's just what I'm going through, everyone goes through who's grieving. And so I think that's where the judgment that we try and make is this normal or abnormal um, sometimes is, is a, really hinders us. And so it's not a question about whether anyone would be going through the same thing. It's a question of whether I can help you with what you're going through. So right now, um, people are grieving different things and many people, or most people, if not all, are grieving something. And so the fact that we're all grieving doesn't mean it's easy. It just means it's it's something we're all going through and we probably could all use help with it. So I think that if a child says I'm doing just fine, I, I, you know, I don't think they're gonna say I'm not grieving. If it's somebody close to them who's died, they're probably going to at least acknowledge they miss that person. Um, but they may say I'm doing fine and that's where I would say, I'm not trying to judge whether you're doing well or not. I just know this can often be difficult and I wanna just make it a little bit easier or I want to assist you. Um, and then they may not want to talk about their feelings. Like a classroom teacher may seem threatening to, or not the right person to discuss it, um, but they can still do something that's helpful. I, I remember dealing with one teenager, I was providing counseling for him around uh, his mother's death after a long illness. And he just looked at me and he said, you know, this school has acted like nothing's happened. And I said, well, what do you want them to do? And he goes, I don't know. And I said, well, do you want your teachers to talk to you? And he said, a couple maybe, but the rest, no. I really wouldn't want to. I said, would you want to go to a counselor? And he said, no, 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 I don't want to stand out. I said, do you want them to change the work that you have to do or your testing? And he goes, no, I should be held to the same standards as everyone else. And then I just looked at him and I said, well, what do you want them to do? And he looked at me and he said, I don't know. But all I know is I lost the person that I love most in my life and they act like nothing has happened. So often it's really not that you're trying to get them to share their deep feelings. Um, and so if somebody says I'm not grieving, that's probably not exactly what I would be asking. Are you grieving? I would just ask, like Marcia said, how are you doing? I understand your mother died. I can imagine that might be difficult. How are you doing? Um, and then I don't, but if you say, are you grieving, then I think some people will say no. So don't ask directly uh, necessarily, just ask them how they're coping and how they're feeling. You know, I think, I think another possibility is to frame the option. So if somebody says, no, I'm doing fine, I don't really need to talk. And then what you can say is, um, I am glad to hear you're doing well. And I want you, you know, what I know from talking with other students or from things I've learned is that sometimes over time questions come up or issues come up. So if that happens in the future, um, please feel free to come to me. Um, and, and then again, to once in a while, check in and say, how's it going? You know, just to keep that connection uh, going. And I also think, you know, the question is, is David, you sort of saying this is, I mean, what do any of us know about what grief is supposed to be like, you know? Um, I mean, children, th this is some adult concept and even teenagers often don't quite get what this is about. So they don't know what grief feels like. They don't know what they're supposed to be feeling. They don't understand it. And as questions come up, you wanna be available in their sphere if they, if they feel compelled to talk, you'd like to be one of the people they might feel welcome talking to. Another amazing response. Um, we are getting close to time, so I'll ask just one more question um, and then we'll head over to the next slides. Um, one attendee asks, during these times, the teacher may also have experienced loss and may be struggling with supporting their students. What do you suggest in this situation? 
Um, once again, <laughs> we do have a we have a whole chapter in the book, um, but but it is very hard if you're grieving yourself. It is it can be very hard to deal with other people who are grieving. So I think the first thing is to acknowledge that and recognize that. Um, and then to sort of assess where are you at? How much can you do? Uh, do you want to step into this relationship more with the student because it resonates for you? Do you want to step back because you need space for your own emotional process? Um, but I think, as David said, we're all grieving right now. Everybody's grieving. Uh, almost everyone, I, I would imagine at this point with nearly over 600,000 deaths in this country, most of us know someone close or distant who has been ill with COVID or died of COVID. Uh, it's been a terrible year. You know, we're all struggling. Um, and so a lot of it is self-recognition. We need to take care of ourselves as well and find people to talk to and support us. Uh, or we're not going to have the resources to give to students. And David, please add yeah, to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting this question from educators across the country, um, particularly in areas that have been deeply hit, by, most deeply hit by the pandemic. And what they're saying is, like, how can I talk to a child about grief when I'm grieving myself? And I tell them, it's not your responsibility to provide grieving, you know, to provide grief counseling to these children, but it, it is your responsibility to at least acknowledge they've had a loss and to help them learn despite their grief and to refer them or connect them with other people who can have further discussion if you don't feel at that time that you can. So our responsibility isn't so much to do everything with every child, but it is our responsibility to try and help them get what they need. And so some of it is just, you know, you do have to take care of yourself as, as Marsha mentioned, but, you know, I get this analogy all the time because I do disaster work. It's like the oxygen mask. You have to put it on yourself before you put it on your child. But I point out, because I've looked at the directions on planes, I, I used to fly a lot. Um, and I, I noticed that in some of the airlines, they actually have a clock that was added. And it shows that after you're supposed to put it on yourself within 10 seconds, but you're supposed to get it on the child within 12 to 13 seconds at the beginning. So in two to three seconds, and I think that's an important point. Yes, you put it on yourself first, but you can't wait another 10 minutes to put it on the child. You, you have to take care of the kid because if they really needed the mask, by the time you were relaxed, they probably wouldn't have survived. So I think we have to figure out how do we take care of ourselves? How do we at least express our concern to children? And how do we get them the resources that they need and there are, you know, school mental health providers that can help with this. There are community-based bereavement support groups. We talk about how to access all of those supports. We just need to help get kids connected with some of them. I think there's also power in role modeling. And so um, we want to let children keep the focus on themselves. One, one of the errors a lot of adults make is they say, oh, you know, my father died when I was a child too, let me tell you all about it. And we don't wanna be doing that with students, but to be able to say, I, I also lost someone I loved and it's been very hard. Um, and, and so I may share some of the feelings you have and I also know I'm going forward and I am being the best teacher I can be. And let's talk about how you can be the best student you can be or something like that. So you can role model that you are grieving and, and moving forward uh, as well. And I think particularly David's worked with communities where um, many, many students have lost parents uh, within a school. I mean, you, I can't remember. There was one, one district you went to that it had like a large number of parent deaths early in the pandemic. Um, Worked closely with New York City Department of Ed, and early on in the early on in the pandemic, there was one school that already had a couple hundred um, members of the school community that had died from COVID. Now, a lot of those were, you know, parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles um, of students and staff. But there were some communities that were really very deeply, and we're, we've all been deeply impacted, all communities. But there are some that had disproportionate numbers of deaths, uh, particularly early in the pandemic. Again, you guys, our responses are amazing. And I think that um, reference is really important too about the mask and like the oxygen because people don't think about that. So 
again, great. People get the book. Um, we definitely recommend that. Um, it has a lot of great information in it. Um, but we are going to head over to the next slide. Feel free to continue submitting your questions. Um, let's see here. David, could you hit the next slide for me? Yes, I'm having. Is it advancing? Not yet. It, it, it's it's not showing my screen for some reason. So let me see, hmm. see if I. I'm going to hide all the webcams. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Can you see it now? Perfect. Yes. Okay, just to remind everybody, um, certificates of attendance will be emailed to you um, after the presentation. You can also find them in the handouts pane if you would like to download them there. And if you are watching this as a recording, um, please be sure to continue listening. We'll let you know how to get your certificate um, as well. Just a reminder that you will be prompted to complete a short survey at the conclusion of the presentation. We would love to know again what you thought of this wonderful presentation. Um, and anyone who completes the survey will also be entered to win a free book. So be sure to fill that out for us. And then I'd also like to share that we are offering a 20% off discount on our products, including David and Ed Marsh's upcoming book, The Grieving Student, A Guide for Schools, Second Edition. Anyone who watches this webinar or the recording can use the code COFFEE121 at checkout to receive the discount. If you're looking for more professional development webinar opportunities over the coming weeks, you can be sure to visit Brooks, the Brooks Publishing website for the latest additions to our Coffee Chat series. And for additional support, you can visit the link on your screen. On this page, you'll find a collection of recommended reading, downloadable resources, and professional development webinars for Brooks and, from Brooks and other leading organizations. And again, one last reminder to everyone who's watching um, this webinar, you can download a certificate in the handouts pane. If you're watching this um, as a recording, you can download a certificate if you follow the link that is shown on your screen. I just want to say thank you again to everyone who attended. We really appreciate you spending your time with us today. David and Marsha, you did amazing. We're super excited for your new book. Um, and just thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you, Naya. Thank you. Thank you. All right, have a great day, everyone. Bye.